Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. An incredible honor to um, be speaking at this conference. Uh, at, even though at this time in the world, it's harder for us to be together. I'm still just uh, happy to think of, of us all together sharing uh, stories of open source. Um, I also just want to give a shout out to um, the organizers of this event, which uh, is no small event uh, at Lewis, who's my host, but also the translator who's translating what I'm saying into Spanish. What a, a, a big talent. So uh, I don't know if there's any em emojis or anything you can give them. Um, just thanks for that. So um, yeah, so the title of my talk is All of the People, All of the Time, uh, and I'll get into what I mean in my talk, but really thinking about um, building an empowered open source culture for everyone. And so uh, yeah, I, I've been introduced, I work on the Open Source Programs Office, which is sometimes you'll refer, uh, he referred to as an OSPO, which is uh, increasing in popularity in companies and organizations that want to have more intention around open source. Uh, so there's more and more op open source programs offices turning up in universities, in uh, government institutions, as well as technology companies. So I, this is something that you'll probably be hearing more and more of. I live on, on uh, sorry, in beautiful British Columbia on the unceded territory of the Souk First Nation. And so just to get started before I jump into the open source uh, uh, specific stuff, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on this talk um, that inspired me to think it like a bit more holistically about open source. And it really started with a vacation that I had this summer. Um, so I mentioned that I live in Canada, and as probably many of you know, going anywhere in the last couple of years is a pretty big deal. Uh, so I decided to take my family to the interior of British Columbia, uh, so away from the coast where I live, uh, into the Rocky Mountains, just to do something different and to learn about a, a region I hadn't spent too much, much time in, although I had driven through there. And so this area is really rugged and wild, and, um, you know, really kind of like desolate as far as it's somewhere that you travel through, but not very often where you stay. Um, and especially well known for uh, the CN Railway. So if you're not familiar with the CN Railway, it was built in the early 1900s and it goes from one side of Canada. So this railway line goes from the Atlantic side of Canada all the way through like, this giant country to the Pacific coast. So it's, you know, thousands and thousands of, of miles long. And this particular part of Canada was known as the more treacherous um, part to, uh, that the railway was built on because essentially they had to go through ice and snow and also tunnels were bored through uh, mountains. So it was like a really big accomplishment uh, that enabled trade and enabled um, travel and, you know, really had a huge impact on Canada. So this is a very famous area that we visited. That's not why we visited, but it was something that we started to learn about when we were there. So even though our, our um, trip wasn't about learning about trains in the train line, that's just kind of what happened. And, and as one of the things that we did was to visit a train museum is because of course, you know, if you're gonna learn, you might as well go all in. <laughs> so we visited this train museum uh, and it was really incredible. They had, you know, old this old steam engine that was just in immaculate condition and um, lots of different artifacts of this era, which were just really impressive to stand next to and a real testament to what humans can build and do. And it also, you know, the museum laid out these parts of the, the culture there where there's um, uh, like tea services and trays and you can start to imagine what it must have been like to travel on these cars through the mountains and it kind of felt, you know, really, really uh, exciting in a way or, or you feel nostalgic for what it must have been like to travel by train. But then, and this is the part that started to get me thinking was, you know, just around the back of the museum, there was a little bit, just a tiny bit of information about the builders of the, you know, all this amazing technology and achievements about the people, um, but very, very little about the people. And, you know, you'll look at a picture like this and this, you know, this is uh, a 
train engine that they used to bore through the mountains. This was just on a, a frame at the back of the museum, just around a corner that you had to pass through to, to go and see more of the exhibit. And this is a second picture again of just people um, that, that were working on the train line. And, and there wasn't really a lot of attention to this area to helping you feel what it must have been like to, you know, work in minus 30 degree weather or to maybe not have the right gloves or nutrition. Um, and so, you know, that really started to make me think about the human cost of the things that we're building. And I don't know if, if, if you do this, but something that I do when I learn something or I kind of have an aha moment like that where it's like, you know, I'm in this amazing place where we're celebrating the accomplishments of people, but we're not really paying attention to the people uh, in the right way. And maybe that's because we're kind of a bit ashamed, uh, you know, that we didn't do better, that people didn't also thrive as part of their role in building those things. And, you know, I think Canada is coming to terms with that a lot more. Um, but in tech and, and specifically in technology, I started to ask myself, do we do this, right? Do, and the answer is, yeah, like we've done this for a really long time. We love to show and talk about the technology that we build. Uh, we love to share the shiny things and admire and dissect and promote the things that we build. Um, but the builders are often a footnote still, or maybe that's what release notes <laughs> like help capture. Um, but the story of the builders is really at times being uncomfortable and a footnote, you know. So if you think about technology that, that those the pictures of us would be on the back of the museum. <laughs> and um, so... On a positive note, uh, so uh, I think open source has been um, an important game changer in that area. So because of the nature of transparency in open source, people have been telling their stories if, if they were not good, which, um, you know, there's a lot of underrepresentation in open source, including non-native English speakers. So I just want to uh, nod, uh, give a nod to that. Um, you know, those stories are being told for a very long time. So you know, 10, 15, 20 years, people have been sharing their stories that, you know, of how working on open source technology has not always been a great experience if it wasn't just a terrible experience altogether. Um, but it's still been good as far as like these stories have come up and they've challenged us to do better. Um, sorry, I should have changed to that screen. So I'm navigating multiple. So these are just like some photos that I've taken over the years of different articles of people telling their stories. So you can, you know, there's there's no shortage of these stories. This is not news, essentially. Um, there are projects like, and I'll just give a, a quick shout out to the Chaos Project, which stands for Community Health and Open Source Software. Um, one of the things that the Chaos Project does is that they build on uh, they take stories and metrics around diversity and inclusion and are working to systemically change open source. So I'm going to just give a shout out there if you're interested in diversity and inclusion. They have a working group. Um, yeah, but so to get more into the point um, here is that I, I want to set the tone of what this talk is, which is you can't separate internal and external open source communities. Uh, so the influence of, you know, uh, an engineer at a company like Microsoft on the community and the community's impact on people who work in open source is in open source. That's a great uh, miss miss uh, speak, but you know it's it's equal that we really need to work together. We really need to think about each other uh, as part as equal as important to the building of the software that we're doing. So, in the next few slides, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the company's responsibility for open source communities and what Microsoft specifically is doing. But I'm also going to speak to how we can also, as community members, uh, make this possible. So I, I can't see anyone. I'm hoping that you're in chat channel somewhere. Um, but I'd love a show of hands of how many people contribute to open source softwares that are not part of your work. So that might be just like tinkering or learning new things. Um, and so I'm imagining that there's a bunch of hands that go up. So that's something that I also do. And the thing that I want to say is that your role uh, in the 
is important. <laughs> it's really, really important from the quality of the work that you do, that the thing that you're trying to accomplish in the world through the project that you're contributing to, the way that you enable and include others will set the tone for the success of that project and community. So everyone, you know, that turns up at a project, uh, you know, has that opportunity to influence both positively and negatively. And then a second question, again, I can't see you, I can see outside, the sun is coming up. Um, but I'll also ask how many uh, of you release, use, contribute uh, to open source as part of your paid role? So that's something I also do. <laughs> so a lot of us wear both of those hats, right? Um, and so how, how well I do as someone that works inside of an organization, working with communities on those projects, is really important to that community, um, you know, and and it's a, a virtuous circle, really. And so, how well the company, so the company I work for that you work for, sets us up for success will impact the success overall. So it takes everyone, right? There's no nice tidy line between us. Uh, and this is a photo from my time uh, working or contributing to Mozilla. I've done both for a long time, uh, and I can just tell you in this photo. There are people who are paid to work at Mozilla and there are people who contribute to Mozilla. And um, you'll see that there's no like line here, right? There's no, um, that everyone's experience is dependent on the other. Um, you can't have a healthy empowered culture for one without the other. So I hope you're starting to see um, where I'm going here is that there's just, you know, it's really important to think about the whole. And and so um, I'm my slides are, not progressing forward, so I'm really, really sorry about it. This is the photo that I'm trying to share that was of Mozilla. It has this kind of like, you know, everyone is there and you can't um, draw that line. There's another photo that I have here from KubeCon, and you'll see that um, there's also no tidy line here. This is not just employees of a company and contributors to products, but lots of companies and lots of contributors and probably also students. And so um, again, it's just really important to um, think about how we can help, everyone can help each other. And if you like numbers, uh, here's a number, 40% uh, of all top uh, of the top 100 start projects on GitHub were released by companies. So the emphasis that I'm making is that companies uh, really need to be very um, intentional about the impact and the goals that they have for community. Um, because there's like 40% is, is a lot of, of open source projects. And I ask myself when I see this number, you know, how well were those folks set up for success? Um, what was the experience of the communities working with those folks were, you know, did they feel like those staff members were ready? Um, did they feel empowered? Did they feel welcomed? And, um, you know, without intention around uh, helping engineers and paid roles or staff do that, then it's a little bit trickier. So when I think about cultural building blocks uh, and building healthy culture, here's these are the four areas that that I think about that are largely based on the culture code, which is a book, um, which I suggest you read uh, if you have a chance. Um, I'd also love if there's TED Talks, TikToks, <laughs> books, podcasts, anything that you think uh, could benefit anyone else thinking about culture, I'd love if you could share those in the chat. Um, so I'll just quickly tell you what I mean by these, even though they might be self-explanatory. So belonging is making sure that people feel like they belong to an open source project, but to open source more broadly, and that they are warmly welcome no matter their diversity angle. So, you know, women, non-native English speakers, uh, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, um, that everyone feels like they in some way belong. And this is for internal cultures and, uh, and open source communities. Um, enable and empower basically means that people um, not only have the psychological uh, support, but also the um, tools that they need. So tooling is really important. It, you know, you can tell someone that they should go and do something, um, but if they don't have the tools, then that can be really hard and honestly a bit unfair. <laughs> um, so enabling empowers making sure that people have the tools uh, to, 
to accomplish something and they know they can do it uh, and they're set up for success. Purpose is that connection to something bigger than ourselves, whether that's, you know, at Mozilla, that's the open web. Um, uh, in lots of other projects, there's something personal that people connect to. So they have a purpose. And sometimes that's their career, right? Like um, open source is a great way to accelerate our skills uh, and to um, achieve more for ourselves and our families. And that that is squarely in purpose as well. And finally, accountability and trust. So um, something that we think about a lot of, at Microsoft is um, you know, that Microsoft is built on trust, and that's something that we want, we bring to our open source projects. Uh, and of course, matters to all open source in that if you trust uh, the project and the people in it, then it's much likely to, to be successful, that we have each other's backs. So the title of my talk was All of the People, um, but that's, that's a lot of people, right? <laughs> Who do we mean? How do we start to, to, um, figure out how to be more strategic or more intentional about all of the people. So I mentioned right now, I think about internal communities of open source. So the people uh, in my role in the OSPO at Microsoft, I think about the internal community of people working on open source and also of all the external communities and contributors, be those other companies, volunteers, students. Um, but here's one of the ways that I break, break things down. Um, the first is to think about those in community facing roles. Um, so in an internal, so inside our internal community, we think about those in a community facing roles. So those are people who are actually our community managers um, or um, open source maintainers, but also people who write blog posts, people who, you know, open issues or respond to issues or PRs. Um, and then on the community side of things, we think of um, community leaders. So people in roles of influence, we used to call them, or probably still call them at Mozilla, like people that can influence positively or negatively, if not kept in check, the, the health of the community. So um, the reason that these folks matter so much is because, yes, they have an influence on the community, um, but also they sometimes are at risk of being negatively influenced. So if you have a community manager come into a role and they don't understand that, um, you know, dealing with toxic behavior or um, uh, different types of verbal abuse or, you know, is not part of their job, um, then you risk losing that, that uh, employee or, um, and the same goes for an open source leader. So if someone comes into a community and they earn a role, uh, at the top of your open source project, um, but and they feel like they have to take on some sort of toxic behavior from from staff members or from other community members, and that is, you know, a, a, a failure of that project because everyone should understand that there's a code of conduct. Uh, there should be a code of conduct first of all, but more importantly, they should understand how that is set up to support them. So. Is there are what are the processes? What can you know a community manager expect from Microsoft? This is a training course that we run to make sure that anyone in a community facing role understands how Microsoft will support them, how HR will support them, how their manager will, su will support them, and that we give them the tools and the knowledge. Um, and also, we um, at Mozilla I built a similar course for the community to make sure that community leaders and those with influence knew the steps that they could take to, you know, report something, a violation of the community participation guidelines, and that they trusted, this is where the trust comes in, that something, that the, the project would do something. So this is one grouping of people that I think about those in community facing roles to make sure that they are empowered um, to enforce the code of conduct. They understand that their role is not to endure anything, which is something that, you know, for a very long time did happen in open source. And it's a lot of the reason why women laughed and underrepresented people uh, were, were driven out. So uh, training is a really good way to help people understand that. And I don't mean like full, you know, know everything, more like, um, I'm not sure if this translates, but like a first aid course, like the very basics, uh, basic things that people need to know. So that's that category um, of people. So we also think about, of course, like this is kind of obvious, but those who are releasing or using open source. So often a step before people become contributors to open source is that they're they're using uh, open source in their, their workflows. And this is something that we um, also talk about as, as a way to get involved in open source. You know, how do I get involved in open source? The answer is, what open source are you using? 
submit a patch upstream, you know, fix something, contribute something. Um, and so like, thinking back to the, the building blocks that I mentioned, uh, empowerment is first about tooling. Five minutes. Great. Thanks, Louis. Uh, Empowerment is first, this is a video that's not gonna play. Oh good, I'm not playing this video. <laughs> um, the first is around tooling. So making sure that um, at Microsoft, we have something called component governance, which for developers shows them the, the open source components that their projects are using uh, and any that might have a vulnerability or risk. So um, the first step is to make visible for people the open source that they're using. Um, so we have a tool that does that at Microsoft. And so if you work in a company that uses open source, I'd ask you, you know, what, how do you identify open source that you're using and how do you look for ways that you can contribute? So this is one of the ways that we do that. Um, I'd be interested to hear on your side. And if you don't have an answer, then that's something you can ask your, your, your manager or um, company lead about. The other category, of course, is those contributing to open source. Uh, we think about these folks a lot. Something at Microsoft we do all the time is encourage people to contribute, contribute, contribute. Uh, one of the first steps to that is we have a resource which you can, there's a link up there, but I can also share it later called how to contribute to open source today. Uh, a lot of people feel like it's intimidating that they have to do a lot of work or create a giant pull request. Um, so we make sure that um, there's a, that they, people understand an easy way to get started. And that includes at the bottom here, diversity inclusion uh, ways to, to contribute. So um, eight ways you can contribute today to kind of myth bust it being a big um, step. We also emphasize chopping wood and carrying water, whether you're in a community and uh, as a volunteer or you're uh, an employee of a company contributing upstream, the emphasis is on doing the non-glamorous tasks. So that's something that we emphasize at Microsoft in all of our training, get involved doing the non-glamorous tasks, get involved being a, a humble participant of open source. And um, we also have some business review processes, which I won't get into, but just to make sure that people's back are not nervous about legal aspects of things. We also encourage our employees to contribute to um, we to the FOSS fund. So every month we give away $10,000 to an open source project um, nominated by Microsoft employees in order to vote on the nominations. People will have had to have contributed to open source to just even vote. So we've awarded 21 projects at this point and uh, continue to do this every month, but it's all around contribu contributing um, that it happens. The other category, because I realize we're going out of time first, is new to open source. You can be new to open source and be uh, a uh, within an organization. You know, there's definitely people hired into Microsoft for their skills who haven't worked in open source, but they're about to. Uh, and then, of course, there's people that arrive at open source projects who are, you know, trying to figure out how to get started. So here's some of the ways that uh, we do that. We first of all connect people to the community, whether you're internal or external, knowing there's other people working on something is really important. Uh, we create community touch points. We have a meetup, uh, a newsletter with shout outs. We make shouting out like a real priority of our communication. Uh, it's both inspiration and recognition. We of course have a chats channel and we have an open source champs program, which is an internal leadership program. Uh, Lewis, that'd be like a Mozilla reps within, you know, for an internal or organization, just make, bringing people together around leadership and open source. We have workshops and training that, that um, we embed in all onboarding or not all, but in a lot of onboarding programs so that when people come to the company, they learn about the code of conduct. They learn how to properly release software. They learn how to contribute and grow projects. And growing a project is squarely in community empowerment, bringing in new leaders, um, making decision-making, something that's organic uh, between you know, the Microsoft maintainer, but also um, the community even more so. So there's that, that stewardship to the community is a big part of that workshop. Uh, I won't get too much into this, but we make onboarding something that happens over time to avoid the funnel. Uh, we also know that a lot of people uh, have a tr have trouble saying to their or <clears throat> communicating to their manager what open source does for their team or their product. So we have a course called um, Mapping Your Open Source Career, which is squarely uses HR resources to let people uh, kind of document their personal career goals and have manager conversations so that you know, the things they do in open source map to their 
their personal goals and that as far as their compensation cycle goes, that it does matter. So we're constantly at Microsoft trying to help people be successful in open source um, through the channels that matter, including you know manager discussions. So finally, I'm sorry I talked a little bit faster at the end there. Um, you know, it's really important to create a sense of belonging in your organization and in your community around open source. People must be empowered uh, by being given the tools that they need and providing opportunities to learn and grow. I really believe in these educational opportunities uh, that also connect people with each other. Um, and that ultimately all of this builds accountability and trust, which is central. And then just that we, you know, going back to my train story, <laughs> uh, is that we get to the story of the builders, and it's as great as what they build, right? Like that the museum should be, uh, of the train, uh, you know, if it was technology, it would be equally given to the experiences of people and how they felt and, um, you know, what they were able to accomplish and not just the things that we build. So for all of the people, all of the time. And I'm sorry I had a couple of slides that didn't advance in time earlier, but hopefully that all made sense. Thank you.